Welcome everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. Okay, um, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Carr. I'm Chief Knowledge Broker at Octo. Um, and we're very pleased to have today with us Paris Stephanoudis of the University of Oxford and the Necton Foundation, and Sheena Talma of the Necton Foundation, um, who are gonna be speaking about turning the tide of parachute science. Um, to let everyone know, before we get started, uh, we'll have a, a presentation from Paris and Sheena first, and then we'll move on to question and answer. Um, if you're, you can send in questions either through the chat um, or through the Q&A form. Um, the chat al allows all attendees to chat with just, you can send a message just to um, the panelists and organizers, or you can send it to everybody who's attending. Uh, we, and feel free to send comments and questions in that way. We just ask that you use it respectfully and keep any subject matter on topic in the chat, but you can use it to chat to share information about the topic, any additional observations or resources that you know of. Um, so welcome, Paris and Sheena. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Should I start sharing my presentation, my, my screen? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm guessing, one, give me one sec, get it on the right. And it's so not can a, you see? We see the notes. Yep. See? Now, now it is. Yep. You don't see the notes. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so hi everyone. Um, so today I'm gonna be. I'm very glad to be talking about a very important issue, parachute science. Um, and just to sort of get us going um, is what is parachute science? So I'm just gonna be playing you this small clip where my colleague Sheena Talma uh, and Will Fredley Kwanon are explaining what it is. Parachute science is a practice whereby international scientists or researchers um, go to a different country for their data collection or field work um, and in the process neglect to meaningfully include um, scientists from that country or that nation. This is not just with regards to publication but also with regards to building uh, skills within that specific research field. It creates a dependency on external expertise, does not address host country research needs, and hinders local research efforts. The legacy of parachute science in a lower income country can and does make the work of local scientists like myself more difficult. So I do hope that you did have the opportunity to listen because I certainly could not listen to it very well. I hope it was better for you, but I'm gonna still be talking about what it is and the impacts of it further down. So, so some of you might have come across different terms to describe essentially the same phenomenon. So parachute science has been also described as colonial science. It has been described as parasitic science and in other occasions, helicopter science. In all occasions, they're describing the same thing. Essentially, what it means is that researchers, usually from the global north, go into locations in the global south. They do conduct research there. They collect data in some occasions, and they go back to their home countries. They don't engage with local scientists, and a lot of the data generated is not um, is not shared with 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 host nation researchers. So some of the impacts of parachute science, some of them have been touched on on the video, but I'm going to add a little bit more detail for each and one, every one of them. Uh, one of the impacts is there is a dependency on external expertise. Expertise, If, if you um, working with just um, out of curiosity, is my screen shared? Yes, it is. Sorry, I'm just seeing a chat. Yes. So 
Some of the impacts of parachute science is dependency of, on external expertise. What this means is that if-, if Paris, we're actually, we're not, we're not seeing your screen. We're just seeing your video camera. Oh, okay. So that message was correct then. Yeah. So can you see it now? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. I feel like I knew beyond Zoom, even though I'm not. Anyway, so let's get to, again from the start of this slide. So some of the impacts of parachute science. The, the, so the first one is dependency on external expertise. Um, so what this means is if, if there is no meaningful collaboration and, uh, and no meaningful uh, knowledge exchange between um, the, the foreign researchers and the host nation researchers, there, there is no opportunity to actually develop some um, skills uh, in host nation scientists to, to create those leadership opportunities. So effectively what this um, create is at the end of the project, um, that capacity is not there. So if there is a new project in the future, then host nation researchers would again be dependent on foreign expertise. Another uh, drawback of parachute science is, is it does not address local research needs. So because there is no effective communication and engagement with host nation researchers, it means that a lot of the research questions posed in the beginning of a project, they're not even relevant to the population uh, of the host nation country. So a lot of the data that are actually generated, even though new information is always good, uh, it's not necessarily relevant or most relevant to some of the priorities and needs of the host nation country. And, and, and as a result of that, you do not develop leadership skills, as I said before. And what this means is there is little international recognition for researchers from that host nation country. So when it comes to future funding applications, which are based usually on publications, for example, if, if, the, if those publications are not there, then that means that um, local researchers applying for those grants are actually at a disadvantage compared to Western scientists, for example. Uh, and of course, all this creates um, mistrust between foreign researchers and, and host nation researchers. So a lot of host nation researchers might see foreign researchers as, as being exploitative. Um, so that does not create a good sort of um, ground to, to start new collaborations, which are really important in, in our day. Uh, and finally, another topic which has not been mentioned a lot, another adverse impact is not only does parachute science sort of um, create a, a, a lot of problems for host nation scientists, it also creates much uh, worse um, science as well. Uh, and, and the reason for that is there are a lot of practical skills, a lot of uh, knowledge about the, the ecosystems that you're going to work in a different country. And all that knowledge resides in host nation scientists. So if you don't work with them from the very beginning and throughout, throughout the duration of a project, what it means is that um, you know, you might interpret your results in a very different way. Maybe your interpretation of the results is, is not realistic or is not relevant to the actual sort of local context. So where does parachute science occur? Unfortunately, it, ha it, it has been occurring and still occurs in many different scientific disciplines. So over the, the last decades, the, it, it has been very, it has been considered the norm. So people didn't even like think about it twice, sort of going into another country and sort of collect data or conduct research without engaging. So it has been found across global health research, microbiology, geoscience, and many other disciplines that we probably are not being mentioned in this particular slide. So one example about global health research, for example, and I'm gonna talk about marine research in this presentation, but for global health research, as an example, to make you understand what, what it could mean is, um, when you had the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa or you had the Zika outbreak in Brazil, what happened is researchers from wealthy nations, not always, but in many occasions, they went to the affected countries, they did collect data, they did also sequence some of them in order to be able to sequence um, genetically the virus. And what happens is they went back to their countries, they did not share any of that data in many cases, they developed diagnostic tests or maybe some uh, sort of um, treatment or drugs. And these same treatments or drugs were being sold back to the, to the affected countries, in most cases in very unaffordable prices. So you can see some of the obviously uh, problems that this creates. Um, and as a marine researcher, I'm going to be focusing um, on coral reefs in this presentation. So for those of you not familiar with those habitats, coral reefs are found in tropical and subtropical locations. Um, they are home to a, an incredible variety of organisms, 
um, about 25% of all marine biodiversity is, um, is found on coral reefs. Um, they do provide habitat for fish and other organisms. And as a result, they provide a range of ecosystem services from fisheries, coastal protection. So they're really important for millions and billions worldwide. Now, because they have been a major biodiversity hotspot over the last, uh, um, over the last decades, uh, marine researchers have been conducting uh, research in those environments. So uh, people from wealthy nations, such as me, for example, uh, uh, they go in countries such as the Seychelles, where Shinatama, for example, is from, uh, and conduct fieldwork there. Now, while that is not necessarily a bad thing, I guess the problem starts when, um, you know, the collaboration between the foreign and the local researchers is not happening in an equitable and fair manner. So uh, having conducted research in, in, a trop, in sub subtropical and tropical locations, uh, you know, we were aware either anecdotally or like from, from um, that parachute science does happen. So what we thought together with, uh, with Sina and together with other researchers is we wanted to try and actually quantify this phenomenon. And the reason for that is, is, is if you put a number behind an issue, it's much easier to communicate this issue to the wider research community, to funders and all the stakeholders that they can actually start discussing this and potentially sort of help, uh, you know, um, uh, address this issue. So we decided to use coral reef biodiversity uh, publications as, as a proxy for marine science in general. So what we did is we conducted a global analysis of articles published over the last 50 years in, the, in that topic. And then we used publication related metrics, for example, authorship patterns or like the affiliations of, of, of the authors uh, as a proxy of, of parachute science. So it was there effective communication and engagement, for example, and that has been used as a proxy for parachute science. So some of the results you can see on the graph on the left, this is the equivalent of research effort. It just shows how much uh, research has gone into coral reefs uh, by which nations. So this is the top 10 nations conducting most coral reef work uh, over the last 15 year, 50 years. And you can see that from those 10 countries, actually only two, which is Indonesia and Mexico, were not high income countries. So most research happens from uh, wealthy nations and coral reef work. And, and then on the right graph, if you combine the information together, you can see that there is a mismatch between actually countries that do have coral reefs and countries that do conduct coral reef work. So from the top 10 nations with most um, coral reef habitat area, you can see that only Indonesia and Australia are actually having uh, significant research efforts. So all of the other countries, they, they produce uh, very little work uh, in terms of coral reef work. So there is this imbalance, if you like, in terms of who's conducting the research in an environment that might not necessarily be the most common one in, in their waters. So there is this, it's, it's a form of Western intellectual colonialism, I guess. And, and if we wanted to add more information about the researchers from wealthy nations and where they do actually conduct the work. So this is a graph from a, from a, from a paper that came a couple of weeks ago. And what it shows is on the left, it has papers based on the institutional affiliation of the authors. For example, if, if it was conducted by authors in the United States, it, it would fall under the blue on the left there. And then each line corresponds to where the, um, the research actually took place. So you can see that um, uh, researchers from the United States, Australia, or Europe, and Central Asia, they have, been con they have been conducting their work mostly in other locations as well, apart from their own institutional affiliation. So some of the United States, for example, they might have been conducting coral reef work in East Asia or the Pacific, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, while um, researchers from the other regions, they were they tended to conduct research only in their own region rather than in other regions as well. So back to our work then, where we try to quantify parachute science. Uh, once we saw the top 10 nations and, and you know the mismatch between research effort and the top 10 and then the top 10 countries with, with most coral reef habitat, then we decided to focus on, on three countries in particular. It was Indonesia, Philippines, and Australia. Now, the reason for focusing on those is because these three are the three countries with most coral reef habitats worldwide. And also because it was an interesting comparison between Indonesia and the Philippines, which are low to middle income nations, according to World Bank, 
as opposed to Australia, which is uh, classified as a high income nation. Uh, so we saw the publications on coral reef biodiversity research over the last 50 years, and then we color coded them according to um, authorship patterns. So with black, it's when a publication did not have any host nation scientists included. In blue, it's if host nation scientists were included, but they were um, included as middle authors. In pink, you have um, publications where the host nation scientist was actually leading the, the, the work. So they were either the first or the last author. And then in yellow, you have when uh, a paper had all of the authors from the host nation country. So interestingly, comparing Indonesia, Philippines against Australia, we can see that about 40% of publications from Indonesia and Australia, they had no host nation scientists included over the last 50 years. And that was double the amount compared to Australia, a high income nation. And when it comes to research leadership, so that is researchers being the last or the final author in a paper, uh, about 30 to 40% um, was um, led by host nation scientists in the Indonesia and the Philippines. Compare that to Australia, where it was much higher, it was 66%. And apart from authorship patterns, we also wanted to measure the number of publications that it specifically mention a permit number in the published journal, in the published article. Um, uh, because having a permit number or an exemption notification is, is a prerequisite to conduct marine research in, uh, marine research in any setting. Uh, and, and you can see here that the number of publications that actually specifically mentioned a permit number was quite low across all three nations. It was still low in Indonesia and the Philippines from between sort of 10 to 12 percent, and it was a bit high in Australia. Uh, now, of course, not indicating a permit number in a publication does not necessarily mean that something illegal took place. Um, it is the authors of this paper sort of believe that in many occasions this will have been the case, especially during the past where, um, you know, a lot of people were conducting research without having research permits in place. So it's really important that journals start to have research permit numbers, uh, you know, as a prerequisite when you go and, and, and publish an article. Uh, so combining all these results together from that study, what we found was that parachute science practices were actually more prevalent in lower and middle income nations, uh, but uh, compared to high income nations where they were still prevalent, but in a lower percentage. And if you wanted to, see, and you can see that over the years, so situations started to get better. So for example, in the 1980s, uh, it was much worse. You can see much more black colors, for example, there where you have more pink and, and, and yellow towards the 2000s and later on. But you can still see that there are uh, occasions of parachute science still happening throughout, um, you know, from 2010 and onwards. And, and ultimately what this creates is it creates a problem both for the people that actually are on the receiving end of parachute science, but also for the researchers who are parachute scientists, because as I said before, the, the science that you produce in the end is actually, uh, is actually worse compared to what it could have been. And then being a deep sea biologist by training, I'm also interested to find out if parachute science does happen in deep sea beaches as well. So this is a paper published in the 1960s, so quite an old one, and it does um, uh, sort of outline all of the oceanographic expeditions that happened from the sort of late 19th century all the way to the mid 20th century. And you can see from this uh, table here in this table there, and that most of those oceanographic expeditions were happening by uh, very few nations such as the, the USA, the former USSR, uh, Germany, and the UK. And the reason for this is that um, deep sea reaches is fairly expensive. You need to have an oceanographic vessel, uh, and this can be very costly. And a lot of the equipment associated with it can be also very costly. So only a very few countries do that. Now, in terms of how that situation might have changed from the 1960s and onward, well, we don't have necessarily the same information in terms of oceanographic expeditions, but there was this study published in 2020, and what it was looking, it was looking at deep sea biodiversity research publications and how they were distributed across the globe. And you can see again here that Europe uh, was accounting for about 50% of all publications related to deep sea biodiversity, and that was covering the last three decades, so from 1990 and onwards. Um, the USA was second with about 15% and, and then other nations such as 
um, Canada or um, um, Japan were about sort of three to four percent. So um, Europe was sort of dominating deep sea research. And if you focus on Europe specifically, the, you can see that Germany and the UK are leading the way, followed by France and then Spain and Italy. Um, so even though we are not able to tell if this definitely was an occasion of where parachute science practices took place, because, for example, you could have an expedition happening, you know, in UK territorial waters, and maybe all of the researchers were involved in the UK. So that's not a parachute sort of science example. What it does still create in the field of deep sea research is it does create um, a situation where most of the knowledge about the deep sea, which is like the largest habitat on the globe, more than 50% of our Earth is deep sea. Uh, the majority of information comes from a very small set of countries. So consider that against all the different international and multilateral treaties that you have taking place as we speak. Uh, and you can see that, the, you know, like there is again sort of an intellectual sort of domination from, um, from very few countries about an environment that actually affects the whole of the globe rather than, uh, you know, eight, ten countries that dominate deep sea research. So going forward, it will be very interesting to try and see from those publications that have been actually published over the last 30 years, how many of them actually have uh, engaged in parachute science practices. And that might be potentially a question for the future. And another sort of related topic to parachute science, or if you like to sort of inequitable practices in, in, in marine research is, is, is the gender inequity in coral reef science. Uh, again, this is a paper that came a couple of weeks ago in front of marine science, and they wanted to see the gender ratio in publications related to coral reef science over the last 15 years. So what they did find is that over those 15 years, so um, contribution of female authors increased from about 18% to 33%. Uh, but, you know, it was still outnumbered by two to one compared to male researchers. Um, interestingly, over the last 15 years, about 30% of publications that did have an authorship team consisting entirely of, of men, as opposed to female authors, which was the case only for 5%. And then they also looked at um, um, authorship order. So who was the first and the last author? So something similar to what we did for 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 parachute science and coral reef research. And what they did find is that, uh, you know, the situation got better from 2003 to 2018. So 2018, you had almost the same number of papers having a first author, uh, a female, uh, as, and uh, about 40% had um, as a first author um, a man. Uh, but then if you were looking at the last author, sort of the senior author, which is usually all the researchers, more established researchers, then you can see there is a, a great imbalance there. About 80% of publications in uh, in 2018, the last author was, uh, you know, was was a man as opposed to woman. And I think with that, I will stop and hand over to Sheena Tauma, who will be sharing her screen. Thanks, Paris. Um, and yeah, I think from that paper, there was also like an estimate that, you know, if we continue at the rate, um, that we've been seeing change um, and involvement of women within coral reef science. I mean, in the next, you know, you'll only actually see change in the next 20 years, which is ridiculous. That's a long time. Um, so hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining Paris and I um, as we, you know, talk through um, our perceptions and our research and my personal lived experience of um, parachute science. Um, and for those who don't know where the Seychelles is, it's a small group of islands off the east coast of Africa. Um, and, um, you know, it's surrounded by the ocean, which means, of course, that the research that people generate from the EEZ is really important, uh, whether it's to input in policy to ensure that we're fishing sustainably um, and uh, having a bigger role, uh, especially as local scientists, uh, within creating and leading that science is really important. Um, and something that Paris didn't mention is, you know, the, the paper that we wrote about parachute science um, actually stemmed from a conversation and conversations that we were having um, during the Black Lives Matter protest. Um, and uh, we wanted to kind of share systemic issues that happen within uh, research and science in a in a numeric way um so yeah very very glad we had 
Paris leading that that work um, and um, and created the you know these different contacts and was able to put this on paper. So the first time that I actually I guess was um, really felt connected to the word colonial science or parachute science um, is when I read uh, Asha DeVos's paper. Um, and she, she speaks about um, colonial science in, in other talks um, and where she talks about her personal experiences of parachute science in Sri Lanka, where she's from. And I guess it hit the nail on the head because you know, as a as a young researcher living in a very small island state with um, uh, very few resources to going towards research, often what happens is that the research is the research is done by external parties, and then maybe you get some snippets. Um, but there is a growing uh, interest from social scientists to be more involved and to start leading a lot of a lot of science that is happening within our own EEZ. So this is a very brief overview of a paper that we're currently working on with a group of social uh, scientists um, that looks at the number of publications um, over the last decades. And you'll see that there's an increase and that's likely because of better transport and people can come to the Seychelles and Seychelles has more visibility. Um, and when we look at the first author publication. So who is publishing or who is leading these publications? You can see that a lot of that is coming from um, higher income countries. Uh, the UK, France are both um, previous colonizers of the Seychelles. Um, and of course, then we'll have um, other countries like the USA and Australia. And very few papers were actually coming out of the Seychelles by Seychelles. Um, and there are a lot of a lot of research that hasn't been published um, that sits in a in a database. Um, and even those a lot of those papers, because they're part of like consultancies and therefore our reports, um, have been led by foreign scientists. So what does that mean for like someone growing up here who wants to get involved in science, right? Because the people you see who are the experts on the news talking about um, uh, the fishery or, you know, what it means to have carrying capacity for tourism or um, the effects of global climate change on coral reefs have consistently um, in the past been very much from the West. So what does that mean for someone like myself who doesn't see themselves reflected when they look at the scientists that are generating information for a country that really needs that information, but those people um, are largely made up of foreign nationals. Well, one of the things, uh, and Paris spoke about this, is the fact that there is that reliance on external expertise. And sometimes to the, to the case where um, national scientists' uh, opinions or research isn't as valued, um, but it also comes with the fact that host nation scientists like myself might not be able to publish as much because we don't have the resources at hand. So, you know, I am really lucky in the sense that I had some great mentors um, during my teenage years that really kind of pushed me to become a, a, a scientist and aspire to be, to be a scientist, right? Which kind of goes against the norm of what you would normally see uh, within the stage cells. And I mean, it's a great thing to see because there are a lot more sexual scientists up and coming um, and hopefully they will have um, the resources to be able to conduct research within our own waters. So Paris spoke about this at length and you know, really highlighted the fact that they are, that parachute science happens in different parts of the world. It happens in different kind of, um, parts of science. So it's not just happening in marine science. Um, and it's been highlighted over and over again. So it's a problem that has existed for a long time. Um, and it's good that it's getting the traction that it is um, at the moment. So what do we see happening around us that can stop the practice of parachute science? So with regards to the United Nations decade of ocean science, um, you know, they've put out the statement where 
they really want to strengthen dialogues, develop partnerships, um, leverage funds um, to enable these partnerships to occur and to engage um, scientists around the world. Um, but this cannot happen uh, if parachute science is happening at the same time. So how do we how do we stop parachute science? Obviously, there isn't like you know a wand that can just uh, stop this from happening because it is intrinsically embedded in our systems. Um, whether that's because of our historical colonial ties or whether it's the biases that we have um, as human beings. So how do we work on, on ourselves to ensure that as researchers, we don't practice uh, parachute science? So some of the things that we recommend in the paper um, is to find academic collaborators in the country where you wanna work. Um, and that isn't really hard to do. You can contact universities, you can look at, you look up NGOs um, to find out where those people are. You can liaise with governments and or funding bodies of those host nation countries to find out who those scientists are that you should be speaking to, to create an academic collaboration. But apart from that, of course, if you liaise with government, um, you might have the opportunity to then feed the research that you are doing into um, policy that they are making. And perhaps the research that you are you want to do or proposing to do um, might have great impact um, in the work that is already happening within the country. Uh, develop a joint research agenda. And this is perhaps one of my pet peeves because um, I have had you know, many groups of scientists um, give me a a fully finalized proposal and have, uh, and have asked me to review it with only two days to go. And, you know, essentially made a collaborator feel like they're a token on the paper, as opposed to once you, when you have the idea, um, contacting the scientists, speaking about the project that might benefit both parties and um, giving that person a chair at the table from the onset. Next thing we can do is engage with the next generation of researchers. And I'll talk a little about a little more about this a bit later, um, especially with my own experience. But it's important that you, you find those graduates, um, especially in small island states or uh, countries without a lot of resources that don't have big institutes. A lot of us come back to the country and there isn't a large institute that can kind of suck us up and become research researchers, often what happens is you become a manager or you go into a government job or you change uh, what you do or you you leave the country, right? So find those scientists and um, they are probably the the next, um, they will willingly engage with you and and happily be part of the research team. Share academic literature. And I think this one's really important because as we all know, um, academia and the way it's set up, it's really difficult for um, under-resourced institutes and countries to actually get access to academic literature. There's a lot of literature that exists about uh, your own country that you cannot access because of the high paywalls. So the least you can do is you know, ensure that you're sharing those academic papers with the people that you're working with. And furthermore, apart from that, maybe share it in different types of contexts. So share it as a research paper and then as an infographic so that, um, you know, if you're working with policymakers, they can understand how that can link into policy. Know the regulatory landscape. Um, you know, this is really important because uh, there is a huge mistrust, especially in areas like um, small island states or underdeveloped countries whereby often scientists coming into the country sometimes mean that you know, they're gonna collect samples and then they're gonna make a lot of money and, um, and essentially the, the people involved won't, be, won't benefit from it, right? And it has happened, which is why that mistrust is there. So ensure that when you go into the country and you're working with your collaborators, you know what the regulatory landscape is like you know what kind of documentation you need so that um, you know that trust is built between the two parties. And transparency in publishing. 
Um, and here, I mean, I, I have, I know of many people who are, for example, um, you know, they come back from a BSc and they go work on a, on an island, for example, and they'll have a research group that comes in and they do absolutely most of the field work. They service the equipment, they retrieve equipment and they get data off and send it to the researcher off in another country. Um, and then they get no acknowledgement for that work. Um, so it's really important to, to ensure that um, and the people involved in the project are also recognized. And I know I've talked a lot about, you know, what we can do as researchers, um, but we do know that this is this is a bigger issue. It's a systemic issue. It's it's things that are that are linked. It's linked to gender. It's linked to our own bias. It's linked to race. Um, so how do we change those things from the inside? So, for example, when it comes to academic and research institutes, how do we change some of these foundational um, biases that exist. Um, and for example, if you're if you're part of a department, you know, setting up a committee where you can create a safe space that students um, can talk about uh, things like parachute science and and learn from from other researchers, that is a powerful start on its own. Um, and of course, one of the big ones is research funders, because the people that hold the money um, have a big influence on how we conduct research. Because a lot of the time there isn't money allocated to ensuring that your approach is collaborative, right? There isn't, there's a very short deadline to when you can put in your proposal and receive feedback. Um, and often there isn't money for that, for that part of, uh, of um, of the of the funding proposal but we need to get to a stage where that you know where um collaborative uh, the collaborative approaches um and the best scenarios are are the norm and not the exception to the rule right so i want to give a couple of examples where this is happening um so mervison is one of them that i found out about recently and i promise i'm not being funded by them um they they gave a a, a talk recently and they're working within the african region with big organizations like the western indian ocean marine science association which have contacts to the scientists within the region. Um, and what the way they work is essentially you hand in a proposal, um, an African and German partnership, and um, that proposal, a very brief one, is reviewed, and then you get allocated time and money um, to be able to do a, a bigger stakeholder meeting and ensure that your research um, objectives um, are of interest for both parties. So I think that is a really interesting model of something that is working within um, the, the African, within the African context. Then, you know, there are other examples like the marine spatial planning that happened within the Seychelles. Um, and this is, this is, I guess, a similar system to what they use in other parts of the world, but essentially, um, you know, they, it was an agreement with government and um, the research and the uh, the overseer of the project were based in Seychelles. They were Seychelles, uh, and they got partners around the table to collaboratively think about where the best places are to designate as marine protected area or areas of of specific use. And of course, there are other examples on the continent um, in South Africa. This is a photo of a program called Semester. And what they do is they, um, they promote uh, researchers, especially early career researchers, and they take them on a, on a cruise around the South African coast for 11 days. And often these researchers are you know, from maybe underprivileged backgrounds or researchers that generally wouldn't have the opportunity and um, they join them up with um, established researchers so that they can network and get their foot into, into the, uh, the science realm, especially of the deep sea. And the photo on um, your 
on the other side, so where my mouse is, is a project called My Deep Sea My Backyard, which is which was run by a group of scientists um, in Trinidad, Tobago, and the US. And essentially, they all came together to kind of create a system where they could um, where they could make the deep sea more accessible, right? By using equipment that can just be dropped off the side of a boat. And they created that uh, in partnership with people on the ground, so that, uh, that information could then be used in policy or whatever was needed. And I said that I would come back to talk about, um, you know, how this has led up to my very own personal experience. So, for example, when I came back from university, um, you know, I went straight into a, a government job um, because there isn't, you know, a lot of research establishments necessarily within the Seychelles. Um, so, uh, you know, started exploring my options within policy. And um, I was assigned the Necton project, which is now where I work. Um, and what's important here is the approach. So um, the approach was to ask the government whether um, a deep sea project was something that they thought was important and whether it was something that they thought um, would be aligned within their, their, their goals. And when the response was positive, then they worked with stakeholders on the ground to define what kind of research needed to happen. Um, so this is, and at that point I was, um, you know, enveloped within, um, within the system. So, you know, being the liaison between Necton and the, uh, the Ministry of Environment, which meant that the ownership of the project became my own. It became every person that was involved felt like they owned the project. So I, um, I mean, that is one of the, the testaments to how you conduct research to ensure that um, the people involved feel like they have ownership over it. And it, to finish off before we, we take questions, um, I think one of the things is that there isn't a magic wand to just like stop parachute science, right? Um, it is something that's complex. It's multi-layered and it's historical. There are, it's complicated. There are underlying layers to this. Um, but the best thing that we can do within our capacity is to ensure that um, our research that we do and um, uh, our organization's research that, that we do is, doesn't foster um, parachute science uh, and it is inclusive and collaborative. Right, on that note, um, I think Paris and I would be very happy to take questions. Sheena, Paris, thank you so much. Um, this was great. Uh, and we have a lot. And thank you to everyone who's contributed um, in the chat, their comments and thoughts and in the Q&A. Um, we have a lot of really great questions. Um, just a few quicker questions about the methodology. Um, there was one question, is country of publication based on first author affiliation? Should I go? Yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, so yes, it was based on, for example, if we wanted to see when a publication did include sort of researchers, I, I guess it, it's all the author's affiliations. It's not just the first author, right? So that's how we were able to determine if, if you had middle authors from the host nation country. So it was everyone's affiliation. Uh, and I think there was a related question uh, where someone was asking what happens if you have, for example, one researcher from Indonesia, for example, being working in an Australian institute, you know, they might be working on something collected in Australia, in, in Indonesia, so is that parachute science? So we could not necessarily be, we could not get that information for all of the papers, so we could not tell if someone based in Indonesia, uh, in Australia, for example, was in Indonesia and vice versa, and the reason for that is, is because not all of the people have online profiles where you'd be able to check where they're from. And that was particularly tricky for all of the um, papers, you know, from, from the old days, 
Now that might seem like, okay, parachute science might be actually a bit less than we think, but it's also the other way around because what happens in a lot of institutions in, um, in other places is you might have, for example, a researcher from the US being working in, a in an institution in Seychelles, for example. So they might be writing a paper and based on the institutional affiliation, you think they are from Seychelles, but they're not. So, you know, it goes both ways. I think overall, um, probably, you know, we cannot necessarily get all the information, but I don't think results will change a lot. Okay, thank you both. Um, now to get into some of the other questions, uh, and there was a lot of sort of questions and comments, and I love the discussion going on, everyone, so thank you. Um, someone wrote, I have also worked in coral reef science in the past and attempted to not do parachute science by living and working in the countries that I was working, Philippines and Indonesia. As a research scientist, postdoc, I was also training local students and researchers and also improving the infrastructure of the local labs, that is buying furniture, improving electricity and water systems, sourcing supplies from local vendors, struggling with research permits and visas constantly, while also helping local students apply for and win scholarships to study abroad. It was nearly impossible to get research done while doing all the other stuff at the same time. Should scientists be doing all the capacity building and logistics too? Or should scientists just do science and find other people, that is support staff, to do, do the capacity building and training? We worked a lot with locals on the non-research activities, but that also took them away from doing the research as well. Yeah, I can I can definitely go first there. And I think, yeah, that is a very valuable point. You know, there is a lot of effort and time that goes into um, ensuring um, that, you know, there's appropriate capacity, capacity building or knowledge exchange or the like. Um, but what I do think with regards to that, and I, I mean, I commend you on doing all that stuff. That's amazing. Um, but I think what we're getting at is the fact that, you know, you're often the exception to the rule um, and, you know, not the status quo, uh, because there is a lot of organizations that actually will set up within an area and never do any of those things. Um, whether it's willingly or unwillingly, that is just the reality of it. Um, and going back to your question with regards to should scientists be expected to do all of that? I don't think scientists are expected to do everything, um, but I do think that um, the approach should be genuine. I think one of the things that we've hammered on, uh, and from a personal perspective, is ensuring that your collaborator, it, it doesn't mean that you have to go and find a, you know, a PhD um, scholarship for someone, but what it does mean is that whoever you're collaborating with um, it's on equal equal footing and equal ground so that they have equal say in what kind of research is taking place within um, within that remit. Paris, I don't know if you want to add on to that. Yes, I can add something from the perspective of someone, you know, like having conducted, for example, like research in Seychelles. So what do you do if you know, say you don't have the funds or you don't have the time? What do you do in this case? And it is hard. I mean, uh, I think there are people that, you know, like they want to do parachute science and there are people that don't necessarily want to engage in those sorts of behaviors, but they sort of do them because they don't think about it. And, and what, what I mean by that is, for example, like uh, in most sort of, I'm going to talk about sort of Western universities, um, you know, you don't get judged by if, if you work together with host nation scientists, you know, your career gets judged if you have publications, first author by preference, and if they're a high impact factor. So, you know, like when, when it comes and you have to do your annual career review every year, uh, people nowadays seem to like more if you sort of do a little bit of outreach work, you do sort of more engagement with host nation researchers, but it's not as important as publication. So unless that changes, I don't think, uh, you know, researchers from developed nations will, you know, they would have to do it, but out of their own sort of free time and sort of with whatever cost that might have on their career. And another one um, issue for that is funding because a lot of these things require funding. So funding for the researcher that wants to actually do like better work, but also a lot of the projects, um, they have to provide funding for host nation researchers to get actually being paid by the project in order to do their work. Because otherwise, um, you know, they have their day jobs, they, they, they will engage up to a point, but you know, uh, even if you have the best of intentions, if you don't pay someone for their time, probably they will not engage as much 
And um, I'm not saying that we did everything perfect. We you know when, when we conducted the project in Seychelles, we definitely could do a lot of things better. Uh, and funding is probably one of the key takeaway messages that I sort of took away from that from that project is that you have to provide more funding to have more people from the country that you're working on to actually be uh, able to work on research and knowledge exchange activities and all these things. Yeah, and I think Paris, just to add one last thing when you were speaking um, is the fact that we're not asking for um, foreign scientists to solve the problem. We're saying, hey guys, let's sit down at the table and let's solve it together. And I think that's where that distinction is, is the fact that, you know, let's, we have this problem, we want to do this research and we want to train X, Y, and Z people. So let's find that funding together. And I think often that's where that gap is, is the fact that it's, it's not about one person doing it or the foreign scientists doing it, it's about us doing it together. Okay, thank you both. And, and I, would, I would also say there were some people who shared um, comments in the, in the Q&A, um, also sort of supporting the view that you know, sort of inadequate funding um, is at the root of the problem uh, for, for really integrating everyone and having the time to do everything that's needed, um, and also supporting that practices sort of, there is a call for um, doing more inclusive science, but that sometimes there's a lot of tokenism. Let's see, one other, another question that came in, um, is there an example that stands out in your memory of an effective collaboration between foreign and local marine researchers in the Seychelles or elsewhere? Maybe one where local knowledge changed the preconceptions of the foreign researchers coming in. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think maybe uh, Paris, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit more, maybe from the Necton perspective. Um, I'm pretty sure, I mean, we, it definitely felt like we were sharing knowledge, especially when on the research vessel. Um, but there are, trying to think of it, um, I guess there is one kind of setup that they've trialed and it seems to be working really well is it, um, the University of Seychelles, which is really new, it, it opened up in 2011, um, and a university of Zurich uh, work together and essentially what they do is they have um, exchange programs and a researcher will come with a group of students and they'll they'll work together um, on one particular type of research question um, and that seems to work really well um, in building each other's capacity and learning um, from each other. Paris I don't know if you have anything uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I'm just going to do again from my experience working, you know, having worked with this project in Seychelles, uh, again, not trying to claim that, you know, we are the best and everyone else is not doing enough. It's just sort of the positive experiences that I had is from the very get go, for example, when we went and sort of um, engaged with stakeholders there, uh, just the very uh, locations that we have visited, you know, that was from Seychelles, because obviously, we just, you know, we haven't been to Seychelles before. We have, we didn't know anything about the locations. Uh, we didn't know like which um, particular sort of, you know, the, the species pool. So I was always working together with with experts from Seychelles and the wider region in order to try and identify all of the these animals that I was seeing in the videos. So um, I definitely learned a lot of things, um, you know, throughout this process, and you know, it went both ways. And I'm pretty sure there are other positive examples as well. It's just not, um, you know. Um, bad examples all over. Okay, thank you, thank you both. Um, there was a question, um, well, first of all, just as a reminder um, from Roland Rogers, um, science in coastal states waters require the researching state to get formal permission under part 13 of the UN law of the sea. If approved by the coastal state, then there is a legal duty to make available the data and places on the research vessel. In the UK, um, government funded MSR uh, requires the principal investigator to engage with the coastal state scientific community. Um, later on, um, he asked if there's any examples, let me find, of a coastal states refusing a request from a researching state uh, made under the law of the seat part 13 on the grounds that it was not equitable. 
this would be an effective way of dealing with the problem by denying access. Are you guys aware of any um, any examples of, of denials like this? Didn't uh, personally denials, no, but readdressments. Um, so um, there's definitely been research proposals that come through. So it goes to the government so to a, a body, which is a Seychelles Bureau of Standards, for example, and then they disperse it out to um, to different scientists so that they can give their feedback, and then it goes back so that um, the onus isn't just on, on, on one person, rather on a group of people to kind of point out if there are any issues. Um, and there's definitely been address, addresses to, to the project where you know, they've been asked to add on uh, more scientists or indeed even add one scientist because sometimes you get requests where there's, you know, it's just people doing research. Uh, but sometimes it can just be requests because one thing that we we you know that you have to think about is as a small as a small ocean state for example you saying no to research that happens in your waters is sometimes very difficult um, because especially if they promise you that they will feed that information back into into your system or give you the the data that you require x y and z right so it is there is a power imbalance there as well where um, uh, it, it, it does make it very difficult to say no, even if there is uh, the Nagoya Protocol. Okay, thank you so much, Sheena. Um, there was a question early on. Um, can the term parachute science also refer to colonial governments intranationally doing research on traditional indigenous lands and not communicating findings or incorporating indigenous expertise in the research design? Um, I don't see why not. It's exactly the same sort of attitude, I guess. It could be parachute science or colonial science. It's 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 the same thing to my mind. And yeah, and this has been mentioned a lot, at least in the, the ocean sort of sphere, in terms of marine protected areas. With, and where do we actually want to, you know, establish those marine protected areas? What sort of effect will it have to um, indigenous communities and so forth? So yes, I think it's, to me at least, I think it's, it's the same um, problem. Yeah, and I agree with Paris here, you know, a lot of these are just, you know, they're just uh, semantics, I guess, the way we, we name things, but essentially it's the same kind of characteristics, right, um, just transferred from one, one area to another. Okay, I figured that was probably the answer, but uh, I wanted to make sure we, we raised that issue um, so that everybody's thinking along those lines as well. Um, we had a question, as a student from a lower income country, the Philippines, doing field work in my home nation, but studying abroad in the US, what concrete steps can I take to make others aware of this issue? How can I, as the student, move forward and also take part in capacity building during my study and after I get my degree? I think that's a, that's a really great question. And I think something that I thought about a lot because I studied in South Africa and then came back to the Seychelles. So I think one of the most important things is going back um, to, to the country, you know, where you can conduct science if you can. Um, and, you know, the power of just giving presentations, like um, I've been invited to do several presentations now just because I've been involved in, in science projects, right? So um, that in itself uh, is a way of, preparing yourself in the limelight, but um, in that way, ensuring that people can see you and see themselves in you. Um, and I think that's that's really powerful, being able to just have a mentor to look up to that looks like you or is from the same area or understands what you're going through is really powerful. Okay, thank you, Sheena. Did you have anything to add, Paris? Uh, not directed to that question, no. Okay, thanks. Um, on a sort of uh, another topic, and this will be our last question. Um, I would love to hear from the speakers about intellectual property rights. I work in geography and the question of who owns the maps can be incredibly important and often overlooked. I'd love to hear your perspectives, ideas. 
I think that's again more appropriate for Sheena to, to because I mean we've been through this process uh, when conducting you know research in, in Seychelles waters and correct me if I'm wrong Sheena but all the data is uh, you know for, for Seychelles and they sort of decide what gets you know what is uh, accepted to be published or not. so they have complete ownership of the data um, but yeah. Go ahead. yeah no I think yeah I think you're right Paris in the sense that um, that was something that was uh, negotiated on the onset um, and one thing that we worked on together at the time, NECT and, and government was how to strengthen our material transfer agreements, for example, to ensure that we had more ownership over that. Um, and to be honest, it does come down to, again, um, the power and the willingness for the scientist or research group to actually collaborate with that government. Um, it's all good and well to be like, oh yeah, but you can just say no, but often you can't, especially if you want those maps um in the case with Necton, um you know we collaborated in the sense that the data belongs to the government and in fact they have authority to say that certain things shouldn't be make, made public right um but that's not always the case and there is many many different examples uh where we don't even know where the data is or what the data shows um, yeah. okay Thank you, Sheena. Um, thank you to everyone, to, to Sheena, to Paris, to everyone who participated. What, uh, what good discussion this was, very robust with real questions and, and, and good answers. Um, uh, we really appreciate uh, Sheena and Paris taking the time to be with us today, and we appreciate them taking the time to do this research and present this, and uh, we, we appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, we hope to see you on future webinars, and we wish you all the best for your work. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you, Bye, Joe. thanks for having us. Yeah.